Okay, here we are again, chapter 24, The Roaring Twenties. This time period is going to be characterized by lots of fun, um, lots of spending, prosperity. Uh, it's immediately after World War I, so a lot of people were looking to get back to you know, the happiness that was in their life um, before they set, about, set off going and fighting in World War I. Now, here are your objectives for the chapter. And I added this so that you can kind of, as you go along, these are questions you're going to have to answer in your note packet, right? And if at any time you're not quite sure, then you need to go back and look at your textbook or, or watch the notes again, right? First thing, okay, you need to understand why Warren G. Harding appealed to voters in 1920. He had a specific uh, election or a campaign phrase, right? He had certain uh, policy ideas that made a lot of people want him to be president. Next one is talking about the economy growing, okay, and then towards the end it's going to start struggling. This is uh, a, a roughly a nine or ten year period, so you need to make sure that you can think about the whole, uh, the whole flow of it. And then the last one is we're going to look at a scandal, okay, I want you to know, to pay attention to why the scandal occurred and how his vice president, Calvin Coolidge, is able to minimize that damage. Okay, so looking at America after World War I, all right. Um, during the war, we all know that the economy did well. We were making lots of goods, selling it to both the Allies and the Central Powers. But once the war ends, okay, we lose the, those markets, those opportunities to make money. And people are going to be very frustrated with this, and they're going to look to blame someone. All right, Europe for not buying their products anymore, immigrants who come to the United States, and also President Wilson right, is going to be blamed for this instability as well. All right, here comes uh, Warren G. Harding. All right, the 1920 election, his campaign slogan was, quote, return to normalcy, right? And that appealed to many people because they did want to go back to how their life, you know, the happiness that they had experienced prior to the war years. All right, and then here would be some of his philosophies, okay? He wanted to lower taxes, which would make people happy, obviously. They have more money to spend, but he also appealed to the business sector of the economy, because he didn't feel that government should be regulating business. Now, if you remember, if we go back through the progressive era, where government was um, starting to take more of an active role in the economy in regulating businesses, remember Carnegie and Rockefeller, right? Harding believed that government should not have as much of an influence. So we kind of uh, find ourselves um, pulling back some of the layers of the progressive period. And then, like most of the Senate, all right, we did an activity in the last chapter dealing with... Um, avoiding joining the League of Nations, right? He symbolized what a lot of people felt in that it was a bad idea for the U.S. to get involved. All right, so looking at some of his business ideas, okay? In order to try and strengthen American business, right, he was pushing for the Ford McCumber tariff, all right? Now this, a tariff, we'll look at it on the next page, but a tariff is going to protect American businesses, right, by raising taxes of foreign goods. All right, so if you're, you want to start thinking about how um, the government is going to protect businesses by raising the cost of foreign goods, right, people are more likely to buy American goods. All right, and there's your, the vocab word tax on an imported goods. All right, so here would be my example. Let's say that we wanted to buy a pair of shoes. Right? A pair of shoes, I'm just going to make up some numbers here. All right, the pair of shoes we're looking at in the United States are going to cost $10. All right? and I want you to write this down. All right? In the United States, they're worth $10. That same exact pair of shoe made in Great Britain might only cost $5. So if we had a choice, where are we going to buy our shoes? From the American company or from the British company? Most of us are going to say from the British company because it's, it's a whole lot cheaper. Right? So to try and help the American business, right, the government is going to pass a tariff which is going to raise a tax right, or raise the price of foreign goods. So let's say they add a $6 tax. Okay, these shoes from Great Britain now cost $11. So if we had a choice, are we going to buy a $10 pair of shoes made in America or an $11 pair of shoes made in Great Britain? We're all going to choose the American shoe now. All right, so the American business is happy because they got to charge the same price and now people are buying it. How do you think that the foreign companies are going, or foreign countries are going to respond? They're not going to like it. Um, because it did, in fact, you know, raise the price of their particular goods. So if you're trying to protect American businesses, a tariff is good. Right? How do you think the American people will respond? They're not going to be happy either because they just went from having a pair of shoes they wanted for $5 to a pair of shoes that they now are going to pick up for $10 a pair. So you need to think it's not just, re you know, not just um, relevant to shoes. This is going to be um, lots of different areas of the economy. 
Okay, now here would be some of the uh, the early years in the 1920s, right? Businesses are going to do incredibly well, right? They're going to grow rapidly. Rapidly, the, the income taxes provided people with more money to spend, so they're looking to buy more goods, right? And you can see some new inventions are also going to uh, come into play. Uh, increased access to power sources, so you start getting um, you know, light lighting in houses, the radios. Uh, eventually, we're going to get to the television. All right, and then new consumer products become popular. All right, we also have an increase in free time, leisure time. So vacuum cleaners, right? What used to take us all day to clean, right now is only going to take us a few minutes. Washers, toasters, and electric fans as well. Right here's a big one. Okay, so Henry Ford. Some people are doing Henry Ford for your Roaring Twenties project. Okay, a lot of people make the mistake of thinking Henry Ford invented the automobile. He did not. Right, he was the first one to use the assembly line, right, and apply that concept to the automobile production. Now, assembly line is simply just a uh, a large conveyor belt where pieces of whatever good it is that you're making travel on the conveyor belt, and you have different workers stationed at different parts of the conveyor belt that are adding to that final product. Right, for instance, if you think the automobile, the shell of the car, the outer, you know, the outer form. All right, and then you got people putting the wheels on, people putting the windows on, people putting the um, steering wheel on. Now, what this does is it allows you to produce more of that particular good, and it also allows you to make that good uh, uh, cheaper. All right, so faster and cheaper. And if you're a business owner, okay, that those are the two things that you're always looking for. Now, if you think of something that's handmade, if it took one person, you know, one person made a car from scratch, right, it's going to take them a long time, and it's going to cost a lot because it is, you know, that that handmade that handmade um, ideal. Okay, so you're also looking at how does it help the economy? You have uh, employment opportunities right, all throughout the United States, right? hundreds of thousands of workers. Right? And then the airline industry also began to use airplanes, uh, or also began to use their planes for delivering mail, for travel, uh, for fun. Right now, this graph is just showing you the amount of automobile sales throughout the Roaring Twenties. You can see the generalization we can make is in 1921, we started at 1.5 million automobiles, and at the end of the Roaring Twenties, we're at 4.5 million. So just a quick generalization from beginning to end, okay, we can see that the amount of automobiles made in the United States is going to grow up drastically. Now, with the exception of 25 to 27, every single two-year period is going to have an increase. And if we're looking at this, which one has the biggest? All right, 21 to 23, which is going to jump there, or 27 to 29. Now, I know they're kind of close, but definitely 21 to 23. You're going to go from 1.5 million to 3.5 million, so a jump of 2 million cars being produced. 